Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to church today. I hope you're ready for the Word of God because it is Easter season 2022. Hey, give Jesus some praise for that. We are here celebrating Easter together. Now, of course, next week is Easter Sunday, and uh, but today we're talking about something very powerful, very important to our faith as believers in Jesus. So the title for this message today is, It is Finished, the Power of the Cross. Um, You know, all around the world, the cross is is a symbol uh, that many people, even people that aren't Christians or don't know about Jesus, um, know represents Christianity. And I even remember when I first came to Japan in 2009, March the 3rd, um, not that you needed to know that, but uh, that's when I came. And uh, I came here with a vision to, to share Jesus with the wonderful people here in Japan, to share the power of the cross because it changed my life so incredibly. And I heard that many people in Japan had yet to even hear about the good news of Jesus. And I also heard that there was less than 1% of people in Japan uh, as believers in Jesus. And But I remember when I came to Japan, I thought, hmm, that might be a bit wrong because so many people, this was 2009, by the way, so many people uh, were wearing crosses around their necks and had big crosses on their t-shirts. And I thought, oh, I think there's maybe more Christians here than uh, than originally reported. But uh, obviously that was just uh, some influence from the West, probably in Europe. And, and it was it just became a fashion thing here, which, which it can be in many parts of the world. But there's a reason why The cross is such a powerful symbol to believers in Jesus because the cross is is the crucifixion, which was a tool that the Romans used to um, punish and kill criminals on. So it's not something that you would normally turn into jewelry or wear around your neck or put on a t-shirt. But to us believers in Jesus, and hopefully to you today, it can mean so much more than that because the cross represents God's great love that He has for you. I want to read a scripture. It's in the Bible, which is where all scripture is, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. And it says, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up His life for us. So we ought to also give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. You see, Jesus, the Son of God, He came down to earth and He died on the cross for you and for me. And it's His great expression of the perfect love, the incredible love that God has for us. But you might, you might be thinking, well, why did Jesus need to die? Um, why did Jesus need to do something that was so painful, so horrific, as being killed on a cross. Uh, How is that showing us the love of God? Now, that is a great question. And I want to share one scripture that can maybe help us understand this a bit more. Um, But firstly, let me just say that when God created you, when God created us, He created us with love, with, with a great plan, with great purposes. He had the best desires for your life. His desire is that you would have a life of love, a life of joy, peace, great friendships, great family, marriage, great uh, meaning and purpose and vision and life. And, and God puts so much good into humanity. But as you know, we live in, in a very unperfect world. We live in a world where it's, all you need to do is look at the news and you can see um, just horrific events happening around the world. And, and there's, a, there's a human condition that all of us are faced with. And the Bible calls that sin. Now, sin seems like this big word, this heavy word, but it simply means to miss the mark. The mark of all the goodness that God created us for when we step outside of that, when we step away from love and into selfishness, when we step away from joy into darkness. And and when we step outside of the great plans that God has for us, the Bible calls that All of that missing the mark, which is sin. And here's what it says in the Bible in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. 
all have sinned and are not good enough to share God's divine greatness. So the truth is of the human condition that there is not a single one of us that has not sinned, that has not stepped outside of the great plans that God has prepared for us. Now, of course, you could talk and say, well, there's different degrees of sin and, and to us humans, sure. Um, but, but all sin has the same result of separating us from the perfect God who loves us and has great plans for us and wants us to live an eternal life with Him forever. And this is the problem that Jesus decided to do something about. God had to do something radical so that we could be forgiven and we could know the goodness of God again in relationship with Him. And this is why Jesus came and died on the cross. But again, you might ask, well, why couldn't God just forgive us? If God is all powerful and, and great and He loves us, why did He have to do something so humbling and so terrible as dying on the cross? And again, that's a great question. And um, well, I actually want to show a quick video right now. Now, this is from the Alpha Youth Film Series, which is an incredible tool. If you want to learn more about Jesus, uh, check out Alpha and all our, most of our Lifehouse campuses. We are running Alpha courses as well, where you can jump in with other people and discuss about Jesus and faith. So highly recommend you check it out. But I just want to share a short clip from that, one of the episodes about why did Jesus die for us. And of course, I don't think there is a perfect example of what Jesus did for us because it's so radical, it's so supernatural, it's so special. But I think this, this little story really can help our understanding of why Jesus had to do something so radical as dying on the cross. So let's check it out together. There once were two little boys who were best friends. They played together, went to school together, they even went to university together. They were inseparable. Until their careers took them in very different directions. One became a lawyer, the other a criminal. As one was promoted to a judge, the other disappeared deeper and deeper into a life of crime. Eventually, the criminal was caught and sent to trial. On the fateful day in the courtroom, he came face to face with his old best friend, the judge. And so, the judge had a dilemma. He loved his friend, but he had to do justice. And so, he fined him the appropriate penalty for the offence. It was a huge fine. There was no way he could ever afford to pay what he owed. But then the judge took off his robes, went down, stood with his friend and wrote out a cheque covering the cost. He paid the penalty himself. Come on, well, I really hope that helped your understanding. It really helped me understand it at a deeper level when I saw this because like we saw in the story, even though the judge loved his friend and, and wanted to help him and, and wanted to see him start fresh and start and have a new chance in life, at the same time, uh, as a judge, he has a responsibility, uh, a responsibility to justice. That if he just forgave him simply because he was his friend, it wouldn't be just. Nobody would look at that and say, that is justice. Nobody would look at that and say, that's the kind of leader or judge that I want in our society. And uh, this is the problem that, that God had to face with us as well. That if he just decided to supernaturally forgive us without any consequence to what we had done, it wouldn't have been justice. And God is a just God. This is what makes him the perfect ruler, the perfect Lord of our lives, because he is completely and perfectly just. And this is why God had to do something radical. And this is why God sent his only son, Jesus, to this earth. And it talks about in the Bible that, that even Jesus, he put aside the glory he had. He put that all aside and was humbled and in disguise as a human, as a slave, he was born as a human, but he was God, but he had to give up so much of that right. Just like the judge, he took off 
Um, he took off his authority. He took off that cloak to come stand beside him as a friend. And this is what Jesus did. He gave up his glory in heaven to come and be born as a human, as a, as a helpless little baby. <laughs> that just still blows my mind. I've got two sons now, and, and our youngest son is still seven months. He's still a baby. And, and just, you know, how cute babies are, but just how helpless they are. And what a humbling thing for Jesus to do, to, to give all that up and come and be born as a, as a baby, as a human and he came to do this incredible thing for us. He came to pay the price of our sin. Because the Bible also tells us that the result of sin, the result of us not being perfect and missing the mark, is that when we die, we can't go to this perfect place that God has prepared for us all called heaven. God's design for us is to have an eternal life with Him in this perfect place called heaven where there is no selfishness and hurt and pain and suffering and war and, and racism. and It's the perfect place of love and joy and peace and unity. Um, come on, I want to go there, right? We want to go there. And that's the, that's the, that's the life we want to have. And, but, but how can God let an imperfect people? Uh, I, I know I'm not a perfect person. If I was to go there just the way I am, then all of a sudden it's not a perfect place anymore, right? And so this is why Jesus had to do something. He had to pay the price for our sin and the price of sin is death. The price of sin is to die. And this is what Jesus came to the earth to do for us. Um, I want to read a scripture. This is from John chapter 19. And, and if you want to read about the crucifixion of Jesus, John chapter 19 is, is a great chapter to read. I'm just going to read verses 6 to 7 here. And it says, When the leading priests and Jewish guards saw Jesus, they shouted, Kill him on a cross. Kill him on a cross. But Pilate answered, You take in him and nail him to the cross yourself. I find nothing I can charge him with. The Jewish leaders answered, We have the law that says he must die because he said he is the Son of God. And, and this is a really important scripture for us because this shows us that Jesus truly was innocent. Now, the Jews here were the ones who wanted to crucify Jesus. And the reason they wanted to crucify Jesus was because he said he was the Son of God, which obviously was true. Jesus lived the perfect life. He never once missed the mark. He never once had an off day where he took it out on someone or was selfish. Or He lived the perfect life that we cannot live that we can never hope to live. Jesus lived the perfect life. He was completely blameless. You gotta understand this. He wasn't killed on the cross for something he did wrong. He was killed on the cross simply because he claimed the truth that he is the Son of God. And now reading on, we're gonna read in verse 17 and 18 from John 19. It says, He carried his own cross to a place called the place of of the skull. Um, there they nailed Jesus to the cross. They also nailed two other men to the cross, two crosses. They put them on each side of Jesus with him in the middle. So again, Jesus carried this cross. He was nailed. Uh, I don't want to go into too much graphic detail, but that, that's, a, that's a crazy thing to have. He was nailed to this cross. And remember, he was a completely innocent man. He did not deserve to be there on that cross. He did it all for us. And then reading on again in verses 28 and 30, later, Jesus knew that everything had been done to make the scriptures come true. He said, I am thirsty. There was a jar full of some wine there. So the soldiers soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a branch of hip of his hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' mouth. When he tasted the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and died. 
Wow, this is such a powerful chapter in the Bible. Um, this scene of Jesus being nailed to the cross, dying on the cross. But He said something so significant here. He said right before He gave His last breath for us on the cross, He said, it is finished. And that's the title of this message today. If you remember this key this key phrase, this key declaration from Jesus that it is finished. So what is finished? What was Jesus talking about? What was the significant thing that Jesus had completed? And what He had completed is He had completed paying the price for our sins. He had com completed paying all the wrong negative results that come from our mistakes. I want to read a scripture from Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, talking about this incredible thing that Jesus did for us. It says this, This includes you who were once far away from God. You were His enemies, separated from Him by your own evil thoughts and actions. Yet now He has reconciled you to Himself through the death of Christ in His physical body. As a result, He has brought you into His own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before Him without a single fault. Whoa, but... You must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Come on, isn't that amazing, guys? It is finished. Jesus has already paid the price for all of your mistakes, all of my mistakes, the mistakes of the whole world have been paid for. And now our only response is to receive that gift from Jesus and to hold on to it and to live in it. Just like that, going back to that video story we saw, the judge, he took off his robe, he stood next to his friend, he paid his friends price. He paid the penalty on behalf of his friend so that his friend would no longer have to pay it. I'm sure he said to his friend, it's done now. It's finished. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to pay that price anymore. But imagine if they went home and, and that friend started to feel guilty or ashamed and he started to make monthly payments to the court trying to pay back a price that was already paid. It wouldn't make sense. It would be a total waste of the gift that the judge had given to his friend. The judge gifted him with a fresh start, a clean start, a new chance to move forward into a brighter future. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for you and for me on the cross. Come on, I feel like preaching now. He has given us a new chance, a new life. It is finished, which means He doesn't want you or me living in guilt or shame anymore. We are set free, reconciled to God because of the price that Jesus has paid for us. You know, I said earlier that um, I'm very blessed to have two boys and uh, my eldest son, his name is Jaden Musashi Rice and uh, he's three and a bit now. And I tell you what, he is a character and a half. He, he, uh, he gives me a run for my money and I uh, love him so much. He's such a joy to father. And like most toddlers that, you know, uh, uh, probably about six months ago now, he went through a, uh, what should we call it? A hyper rebellious stage. Um, I'm sure all the parents out there, a lot of you can relate to this, but um, there was this time when just everything was a battle. You know, let's go to the park. No, let's go home from the park. No, let's get in the bath. No, let's get out the bath. No, there's that stage in a toddler's life sometime where they just want to fight over everything. Um, and so, of course, as a loving father, I love my son, Jaden. I give him grace, but also I've got to teach him. I've got to discipline him. I've got to help him learn that there's some things that are not just acceptable. Um, you know, for example, 
um, purposely standing on your baby brother's hand while he's lying on the floor. That's not acceptable behavior, right? There's got to be some teaching and some learning there. And so we've tried many different strategies on, on how to discipline Jaden, and some have worked much better than others. But for a while, we were doing time out. And so when Jaden would do something wrong and we'd, we'd put him in time out, and uh, just for a few minutes and, and I'd come back and, and I'd, I'd get down at his level. I'd look him in the eye and I'd just say, Jaden, why did you get time out? And he would, you know, tell me, oh, you're not listening to daddy or pushing Tyler or whatever it was. And he's a smart kid. And, and, um, and I'd just say, all right, well, let's, you know, say sorry to daddy or say sorry to mommy or say sorry to Tyler, whoever you needed to apologize to. And, and, and then I would just give him the biggest hug, look him in the eye and say, I love you, son. I'm proud of you. Well done let's go get some cookies or let's go to the park or let's have some fun together. And, and most times, you know, Jaden would just bounce straight back. And, but I noticed it was sometimes when we'd said, he'd said sorry, we'd, we'd, you know, we'd reconcile love and grace and it's, it's dealt with, but he would still, he'd be, you could see that he was still down. He was still feeling guilt or regret of what he did. And, and um, I would just grab him and look at him. And I'd just say, I would say these words to him, Jaden, it's done. It's finished. We've dealt with that. It's in the past. Let's, let's go have some fun. Come on. And I'd maybe like tickle him or like throw him up in the air or something just to, you know, try and get his emotions back up again to where they should be. And, and, and I just started realizing, man, I think that's such the heart of the Father that we get from God, that, that God is saying to us, I think I really feel in the Holy Spirit right now, God is saying to some people listening right now, come on, my son or my daughter, it is done. You are forgiven. I've paid the price. You don't have to strive to get to me. You don't have to work to get to me. You don't have to feel guilt and shame anymore. <laughs> when I see you, I see you as forgiven. I see you as holy and set apart and blameless. Not a single fault. I just see the child that I created and I love. Come on, let's, let's have some dinner. Let's relax. Come, let's come into my presence again. And, in, and I just pray this Easter time, if you do already know Jesus, like, like it says in Colossians, let us stand firmly in this truth. Let's hold on to this truth that we are forgiven. It is done. We are reconciled to God. We're not working to get to God. We are living in the grace and the presence of the loving Father. And He is continuing to lead us into a better future with Him leading our lives. And if you don't know Jesus yet, in just a moment, we're going to pray and give you an opportunity to receive Jesus into your life because Jesus died for you too. But of course, we know the great news. Spoiler alert, Jesus didn't just die, right? On the third day, He rose back to life. He is a living, powerful God today. That's where the power of forgiveness comes. With. Jesus didn't just die, but He rose back to life. And don't worry, next week, we're going to talk about the power of the resurrection. Um, so I won't get into that too much, but... Let me just say, the Bible says, if anyone chooses to believe in Jesus, that they will be saved. If you simply choose to believe this message today, that Jesus came for you too, that He died for you too, He rose for you too. And if you choose to believe that, you can be set free. You can be reconciled to God. You can come to know God yourself today. So right now, if you can do so safely, close your eyes. If it's not safe, if you're driving or walking or something, keep your eyes open. But I'd love to pray right now. Firstly, I just want to pray for, for all the believers listening to this, um, anyone that you already know Jesus. Let's just, let us pray that we would hold firmly to this message. And, and also just, just to mention as well, like it says, let us be carriers of this message. Let us not keep this message to ourselves, but let us be proclaimers of this message. Let us share this message to the people around us too. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for all that you did on the cross for me, for everybody. 
And right now, Jesus, we're choosing again to hold firm to your message that we are reconciled to you, that we are forgiven, that we are living in grace. We are living in forgiveness. Let us never let go of that truth. And today again, we just choose to praise you, Jesus, to thank you, Jesus, to worship you, Jesus. Thank you that you did all of that for me. And let us be able to share this great message of hope and love to people around us. Let us share the love of the cross, this message that it is finished to all of those around us. Empower us in your mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. But come on, if you don't know Jesus yet, this is your time. This is your moment right now. I'm going to count down from three and I'm going to say now. And in your heart, choose to believe. Choose to believe this message of Jesus today and you can know God for yourself and your own life. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Now. Just right now, say yes to Jesus. Come on. God, I thank you for every person making that decision right now. I just pray as they open their hearts to you, Jesus, you would just fill them with your incredible love, grace. Forgive them, Jesus. Set them free. Fill them with all of your goodness. And we thank you, Jesus, that from today, you are with them, leading them into the great future that you have for them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Come on, guys. Well, it is finished. And this message is finished too. So I hope you're blessed. Hope you've been encouraged and lifted by this. God is with you. Be blessed and we'll see you guys soon.